Good morning. What a beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day to come together and to worship. We want to welcome all our visitors here. I see a few that are, that are here. That's great. Thank you so much for coming to worship with us. Uh, thank you, Sandy and Ray, for, for the prelude. And we really don't have any announcements. Karen always does such a good job between the screen and the bulletin. Take the bulletin home with you and use that for a guide through the week uh, for things that are coming up. And being we don't have very many, well, and then one announcement, of course, I am not Pastor Luke Wolf, uh, if you're looking on the live stream. Uh, he is off this week on, a, on time with his family for vacation, and Pastor Weirs will come forward later and, and worship or lead us in the word. So, but now let us rise for call to worship our call to worship. You know, this is something that we do every week, but it's something that we shouldn't take for granted. We should, this is the time when we are called away from our visiting, our other things that would happen on Sunday morning and our time of busyness and everything and to, to focus in on our worship, God's people gathered in this place to worship him. And our call to worship today is taken from Nehemiah 9, verse 6, you are the Lord and you alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Let us respond with a hymn of praise, number one in great hymns of faith, worship the king, all the verses. Please be seated. Our call to confession is found in Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let's take a moment 
to confess our sins, and then I will lead us in a prayer of adoration and confession. Heavenly Father, the prophet Isaiah tells your people to lift up their eyes on high and to see who created these, who brings out their hosts of stars by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. We, your people, come before you knowing that you are the creator and sustainer of all things. Yet we, and we do, call you Father. We confess that we fall short, that each day when we should be turning to you, we turn to the world, we turn to other things, that we fall into sin so easily and that we need you so badly. Help us this day and every day to fight against the evil that wants to overtake us Change our hearts, Father. Transform our minds and help us to be holy as you are holy with the Spirit's help each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from that same chapter down farther, verses four and nine, Ephesians two, four and nine. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and, raised, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Let us stand and sing from great hymns of faith, a song of praise and celebration, 143, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
deacons come forth for the offering. Time for us to worship through our giving. Father, we give thee but thine own, whatever that gift may be, because all that we have, everything that we have, comes from you. And we just have the opportunity to give back joyfully and cheerfully back to your kingdom, to build your, your kingdom here on earth. Bless this offering, bless this service that we can do. Guide and keep us as we do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's stand for the doxology. Now, let us confess our faith using the New City Catechism that we've been going through. Question and answer 40 and 41. I will read the questions and we will respond together with the answers. What should we pray? The whole word of God directs and inspires us in what we should pray, including the prayer Jesus himself taught us. What is the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, go ahead and be seated. Please be seated. Let's spend some time in prayer of thanksgiving and supplication. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, we come before you with thankful hearts. You have blessed us so much as your people. We thank you for this church for your people gather here to worship you, for the word that is preached here, the word that calls sinners to Jesus Christ and shows us the way of life eternal. Continue to bless this church. Bless our pastor and his family. Bring them home safely after a time of vacation to continue their work here. Father, bless, please bless our children and our teachers as we start Sunday school next week. What an opportunity 
to teach our covenant children about the love of Jesus. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be with Rod Schwab, who is now able to come home. We're so thankful for that, that things are going well. We ask for your blessings on him. Please be with Kim Veniga and watch over her as both of them can recover from organ transplants. transplants. Please, Father, bless them and keep them. We thank you so much that within our congregation we can celebrate two weddings, Trevor Hook and Ashlyn and Morgan and Connor Scholl. We pray that you will bless their marriages, that you will help them, Father, that Jesus will be the center of their marriages, the center of their devotion. We pray that you will continue to bless them and strengthen them and, and help them to serve you with their lives. Bless Cassidy Borwig and Jacob Eilers as they serve our country in the military. Continue, Father, to be with our shut-ins and those in nursing homes. Bless them, Father. Strengthen them. Help them in their loneliness. Help them to know that you are always near. Be with our country, Father. Be with our president. Be with our leaders. Help them to make good decisions. Father, we see sometimes so much, so much that is pulling our country apart. Help us, Father. Please, please unite us under the cross of Christ. Please, may there be a coming back to the scriptures and an annoying of our faith. And Father, we pray that you will be with Reverend Weirs as he comes forward to preach the word to us. May it truly change our hearts and transform our minds so that we may continue to serve you well. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Weirs, if you would come forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. It's good to, good to be back here with you folks again. This is uh, kind of our ho church home away from home, you might say. We, uh, as you are all well aware, we do have some connection to your congregation, so we are, we are grateful to be able to, to be here this morning. Our text this morning is from the book of Revelation, chapter 13. I will give a little bit of explanation of the context of that in just a little while. Uh, starting in the middle of a book that is uh, oftentimes a very puzzling book to a lot of people. But let's hear the word of God. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. To it the dragon gave its power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads seemed to have, had, have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given its, his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. And if anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must be, he be slain. Here is a call for endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast arising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. 
and makes the earth and its, and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven and earth in front of people. And by the signs, that is, it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. It deceives those who dwell on earth, telling him to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both slave and free, to get marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. We ask and pray that we would be attentive, that we would have understanding on what at times can be a puzzling passage. We ask that you would give me clarity as I proclaim your word and boldness that we would under, that I would be able to proclaim the truth here clearly, and that above all, all of us would have ears to hear what you have to say to us today. From Christ's name we pray, amen. In the last couple of months, we've had, uh, of all the holidays that we have during, out the, during our calendar year, we have our two most patriotic holidays, Memorial Day and Fourth of July. Those holidays cause patriotic feelings, certainly, to well up within us. We just recently had the Olympic Games, and we didn't, my, we didn't watch at our house the Olympics much this year, but uh, when that flag goes up, if you're like me, it can, can't help but raise patriotic feelings in our hearts. You know, some of us may wear, wear patriotic t-shirts and fly our flags and just do other ways to show, to try to demonstrate to the world that we love our country. However, it's important for us to remember that we have a higher loyalty than just the loyalty to our nation. And this passage that we have in front of us, Revelation 13, reminds us that in addition to the positive views of government, civil government, the scripture gives, places like Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, there's a flip side to that, one that we need to take seriously. There's another perspective on civil government and that is that it can go bad, and even as the title of the sermon today, demonic. And we need to take seriously those reminders. A couple of lessons we're going to learn from this as we unpack this, pack, this uh, passage today. But let me just give, a, give us a little bit of background, because you might be saying, oh no. He's preaching on the book of Revelation. Never could understand that, you might be thinking. What in the world is that book all about? And you might be, or maybe you've watched a few TV preachers and they got charts all over, all filling in front of them with pointers and they're going around and this is this and this is that and they speak with great, and great confidence about what this is all about and you say, oh, I'm not quite so sure I would have the confidence that that TV preacher has on what, this is, what the, all of this means. But just, as I said, a little bit of background. First of all, there are four major schools of interpretation of this book. One, and the title, what the scholars call it, is the preterist, and that's a fancy word that's saying it all happened back in the first century, at least most of the book, all the way up to chapter 19. It's all done. This is referring, they would argue, to the persecutions under Nero Caesar. This is all, under this view, all done. There's another view called the historicist view, which says this, is un this unfolded in the history between the early church and now. And while this is not real popular today, at one time it was the most popular interpretation. And it was the, the interpretation that most of the uh, Protestant reformers and the old Protestant theologians, the old Reformed and Lutheran theologians, for example, almost always adopted one version of this. In other words, they're saying that this is some figure during history. The most popular one was that this was were the uh, evil popes who persecuted Protestant Christians. But there were others. One scholar who studied this said that from between the years 1560 to 1830 alone, he found 100 different candidates for who this beast would be. 
like I said, this was really popular for a while. Not too many people today, but it was popular. So if they would have had TV preachers, he would have been had his charts and would have been various people throughout history. The most popular view today is that sees this all in the future. And it says that this is all somebody still to come, a really bad dude, you might say, who is to come. And the, the most popular version of this popular one says that this is primarily not for the Christian church, but it's for Jewish people because they argue that Christians get, the, they, the term is raptured out of here before any of this happens. And you may have heard people, the TV preachers particularly today, like this. And that this is something we don't really have to worry about other than maybe speculate a little bit, which lots of people have speculated on who this evil beast would be. Uh, and in, among the speculations uh, have been Hitler, Mussolini, John F. Kennedy, Gorbachev, because he had that funny mark on his head, Henry Kissinger, or my, the most interesting one was Ronald Reagan. You might say, Ronald Reagan, where did they get him? Well, that's because all of, three, all of his three names, Ronald Wilson Reagan, have six letters, <laughs> and somebody, somebody speculated. So you might be giggling at this and say, what in the world kind of, well, this was hap this what happens is when you start speculating and trying to say this is this is this and you read your Bible in one hand and your newspaper in the other. But I th think we're on a little better ground if we if we get to the, the last interpretation, which is so the so-called idealist interpretation. It said this is not talking necessarily <clears throat> about a specific person, but about a principle, a principle of opposition to God. Well, each of those viewpoints has has some validity, some truth. But the, what did you notice about the first three? They all tend to make it absolutely irrelevant for you today. <laughs> Two of them said it's already passed. Don't have so other than maybe a lesson from history, not relevant. Yeah, the third one said it's all future. Since it's all future, it doesn't touch you today. The last one says it has principles, but it tends to disconnect it from anything you can touch and feel from history. So what most really good scholars have been saying, and I think this is the way to go, is to say, yes, we should see that last one. It's an I the idealist, as it's called, but we should realize that it takes concrete manifestation in various people throughout history. That principle of opposition takes concrete examples. For example, Nero was an example of the beast because this beast can be fulfilled in more than one person. Those bad popes who persecuted the Protestants, they were an example of the beast. Hitler was an example of the beast. Stalin was an example. In other words, this beast can show up in more than one form. That then says this is something incredibly relevant for us because it doesn't mean at all. Matter of fact, it's likely we will see more, maybe one or more examples of this showing up. If the early church faced Nero, the Protestant reformers faced evil popes, who persecuted biblical Christians, if Germans under Hitler faced persecution, so may we. Now, some of you might be saying, yeah, but this is the U.S. This is the land of the free, the home of the brave. This couldn't happen to us here. Well, let me just give you a historical example. Think 100 years ago. Think of the country that many of your particular ancestors came from. Germany, if 1921, you had told a number of Germans, there's going to be a madman who's going to convince you to put Jews in gas chambers, start another world war, going to put, do all kinds of things. What do you think uh, lots of Germans would have said? They would have said, you're nuts. You're absolutely crazy. But 12 years later, Adolf Hitler was voted in by a democratically elected election. Now, I have to say that I know, I know where that part of Germany where most of your ancestors came from, but that was one of the parts of Germany that was the most resistant to Hitler. They tended to look at him as that crazy Bavarian down from south, southern Germany, and the, the, the Ostfriesland portion of Germany. They, they were actually quite resistant, but there were enough people in that part of Germany to allow Hitler to take over there, too. You know, the, the Frisian people, 
maybe had tended to resist, and they did have a history. My, my family comes from the West Friesland part, portion of the Netherlands. Six out of my eight grand, great grandparents came from that area. And, that, and they have a history, those Friesian people, of course, of loving, loving freedom. As a matter of fact, I have to tell you this here because this is a great story. There was one of the North Friesian Islands. The Friesian Islands go all the way. My, when a couple of my answers came from the very southernmost, but the very northernmost was originally a part of Denmark politically. And then after a war, in the late 19th century, it became part of Germany. And Kaiser Wilhelm wanted to go visit this new territory. And he landed there on this little North Friesian island. And he, uh, he introduced himself to the burgomeister of the uh, local village who insisted on calling him Billy rather than Kaiser Wilhelm. <laughs> in other words, you may be the Kaiser, but this is still our, our, our uh, island here. You know, that's, and people like that say, you know, we, we cherish our freedom. We were never made serfs like the rest of those Germans. That's true. The Frisian people were never made serfs. And you might say, this is, how is this going to happen here? We have that heritage. My dear wife has that uh, Scots-Irish heritage. And, and the best example of that, have you ever seen that movie Braveheart, where uh, he yell, he's yelling as he's dying, freedom, freedom. You know, how can that happen? This is the United States. We have these kind of heritages. But it happened. This passage is here to remind us that government can go demonic. And government is an institution that was ordained by God. And that's our first point that we want to see here, to be reminded of, is government is an institution ordained by God, but this passage tells us it can become co-opted by sheer evil. The images in this passage are a composite picture from Daniel 7, of the various beasts that are found there. It's like they took all of them and threw them in a blender and put them all together. And one person, one scholar has said, this is an amalgamation of political villains throughout biblical history. And this beast comes out of the sea, which for the Jewish people was where all bad things come from. You know, we our sci bad sci-fi movies you can pick up in this. You ever remember those old, those who are my age or older, remember those old bad sci-fi movies from the 1950s, those old black and whites? Where did the beast almost always come from? Came out of the sea. You know those movies where, where they, it, they're Japanese made and, and the guy, the word that comes out of his mouth says hi, but you can see his mouth move in 10 sentences, but hi comes out of his mouth. You know the kind of movies I'm talking about. Where does that beast always come from? From the sea. The Jewish people said the sea was a bad place. They didn't like the sea. They weren't sailors. But it came out of the sea. And because it's a composite picture, it's best to see this as a composite picture of all political power that can go demonic rather than referring to necessarily one solitary individual. Sometimes people will refer to this beast as the Antichrist. But 1 John reminds us there have been many and will be many Antichrists in this world. And anyone who denies Christ has the spirit of Antichrist. This particular beast in verse 4 tells us it's connected with the dragon. The dragon, which is surely in, this, in the book of Revelation as a picture of Satan, has given his authority. This beast, that's why it's saying it's demonic, because Satan has given it, this beast, its authority. Matter of fact, if you look at verse the end of chapter 12, this, the, the devil, Satan, has been seeking to persecute the church of God from the very beginning. And it says it gives it authority for 42 months, which I don't believe should be seen as a specific time that you get your calendar out. This is a way of saying this is a shortened period of time. It's half the length of, the, of Daniel's famous 77s. In other words, this is a time that's cut short. It's a time that has a limit to it. And that should, be help, that should be important for us. Because God is saying that time is limited. God gives this beast free reign. That's what the text says. And it's hard for us to, to take sometimes. That God would give this demonic government free reign. But it says very clearly in this text, God does. God gives this beast free reign. But he limits the beast's time. This beast, uh, 
verse 3 says, the whole world marvels at this beast. In other words, people don't look at it and say, this is hideous. Who would want to, mar who would want to worship this beast? They marvel at it. They think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. The whole world marvels at this beast. And nobody except God's elect. Those, it says, whose names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. They're the only ones who resist this particular beast. Everybody else goes along with it and says, wonderful, marvelous, this beast. Verse 10 says, here's a call for endurance and faith by the saints. In other words, God doesn't say he's going to get us out of this. What he says is, this is a call for endurance. The second thing we want to see in this passage is, this beast, this government gone demonic, because that's what this is, is aided by other institutions ordained by God in it to do its demonic work. Because there's a second beast in verse 11. It looks like a lamb, but it spokes like a dragon. It speaks like a dragon. Now, looks like a lamb. When you look at a lamb, what do you tend to, to see? Something that's going to come and maul you? <laughs> Something that's going to do harm to you? What does a lamb look to you? Absolutely harmless. If there's any little animal that looks harmless, it's a lamb. But this harmless looking but blasphemous speaking beast works in conjunction with the first beast. The goal of this second beast, which is religious institution, because that's their religious uh, overtones are very clear in here. It's dealing with issues of worship and signs, which are almost always in scripture connected with, with legitimizing a religious movement. These are false signs, but they convince people, these religious institutions, to worship the first beast. The goal of this whole, inst this second beast is to worship the first beast. That's what the text makes very clear. Now, this beast is responsible for the infamous mark of the beast, uh, as it's called in here. And this has led to an incredible amount of fruitless and strange speculation over the years from people who've tried to find hidden meanings in Nero's name. They found all kinds of ways to get Nero Caesar to come out to the number 666 to people who've talked about putting computer chips in your foreheads. And, you know, that's what the TV preachers, a lot of them, like to say here. Be careful. Don't let someone put a computer chip in your forehead and that, that sort of thing. But the point of this is, is that this is designed to coerce us. This is, a, this is a, a, a human number, it says. It's a, a, it's a number of a man. The divine numbers are always seven. This number falls just short, one short in every one of its numbers. Because it's humanity, this beast is, is getting humanity to try to usurp God's place. And there's this tight collaboration between these two beasts will use economic power, which shouldn't surprise us because if you go on in the book of Revelation, it talks about Babylon the Great, which is very clearly an economic power because they sit around in chapter 17 and they say, look at how great Babylon the Great is. It brings, has merchants that bring us all this good stuff. You know, it's like, it's like a Walmart and a Costco and all those stores all thrown into one. It's got everything you could possibly want economic power, but then it says it will use economic power to put the squeeze on those of us who will not bow to the demonic government. What this all implies for us is that God-ordained entities such as government, religion, because that's what this is talking about here. In other words, religious organizations, economics are all working together they will all collude. What are they trying to do? To stop the kingdom of God. You might say, how does that work? Well, you know, let's go back to use Nazi Germany as our example. The Nazi party got voted into power. What did they do? They, call, they got into a collusion with, with, the, with the business leaders, but they also used the church. There was a movement called the German Christians and they started, tried to remake the church in Germany in what they called the German Christian Church. 
which did nothing but glorify Nazism. There were resistors, there was a confessing church. And a number of the, of the reformed churches were a part of those confessing churches. And they said, no, they signed a Barman declaration. They said, we, we, this is idolatry. This is worship of the state. It is, this was exactly an example of what's going on here. But a significant portion of the church went right along with it and did everything within its power to get people to bow the knee to the Nazi ideology and the Nazi power. That shows you that it's, it's not at all inconceivable that religious movements can be co-opted by pure evil and can change their focus to glorifying a demonic state. Now, what's important for us is today is just not that maybe the political party we don't happen to like isn't in power or anything like that, because political movements come and go. They have in our country. But what is important for us is the fact that as many recent cultural and historical studies have shown, we have been seeing in our own culture in the last 200 years a dramatic shift in our culture that has been brewing. Since the late 18th century, about from the time our nation was founded, our culture has shifted forward along a belief that the uh, studies, students of cultural history have said is, an, is toward what they call expressive individualism. That's a, a way of thinking that says, whatever I think is right, whatever makes me feel good, is what I should follow. It's a, it's a psychologized definition of what it means to be a human re being. Rather than being a human creature made in the image of God, designed to serve God, this way of thinking says, we are here <coughs> to do our own thing, as my generation grew up with in the 1960s. Ethics are defined as emotional preferences, rather than adherence to any universal, let alone biblical, principles. You know, it's... it's it's sad, but many otherwise conservative libertarians are quite willing to go along with this. Because doesn't that sound very American to say, you should be able to be anything you want to be, right? Sounds nice and American. Until you start unpacking it and seeing what that's saying. It's saying not that you should be anything you should be. It's saying you can be anything you want to be. And what does the scripture say? The heart of man is what? Deceitful and desperately wicked. It starts saying that we, we are dri what be what's driving us is what we want to be, not what we should be. For example, I hate to, hate to pick on, on uh, the Disney movies, but frankly, every Disney movie <laughs> operates from that philosophy. You can be anything you want to be. And, so, and let, lest uh, the people with those small children feel like you know, you've, you've been singing me, those of you who might like to watch all those Hallmark Christmas movies, you know, the ones where the plot's virtually the same every time, only the char characters have been changed to protect the innocent. You know, those, those movies, they have the same view in it. Follow your heart. How many times don't you hear that? Follow your heart. Yeah, you're going to follow your wicked, evil heart? That's what's brewing in our country. And it leads to a whole shift and change in the way of thinking. There's been a view of human progress that says we are getting better and better. The past is something to be left behind. We're all getting better and better. Now there are some things that have gotten better, but human nature is still the same. And it's not perfectible in spite of what some people will tell you especially when it's defined by this whole thinking that says we can be anything we want to be. Most of the Marxists have had their view of the perfectibility of human culture, and it was going to be a worker's paradise, and they left how many m millions of dead people in their wake? But you know, it's interesting, about 100 years ago, a group of German scholars called the Frankfurt School of Marxist thinking decided to shift this away from economics into the area of sexuality. You want to know where all these weird sexuality notions are coming from in our society? It was heavily driven by a bunch of Freudian-influenced Marxists in the 1920s. And they started saying that the problem is, is, is not uh, economic oppression, it's sexual oppression. And so they, they were, they're, they're the thinkers that gave us all of this. 
you might say, well, what a bunch of nutty German thinkers. What, well, they were, uh, they were heavily Jewish in their ethnic background, so when Hitler came to power, they fled. And guess where they came to? The US, and Columbia University gave the Frankfurt School a, a place to teach, one of our premier elite American institutions. And that thinking has been permeating our thinking for over 100 years. In other words, we've had a cultural revolution that has reshaped education, business, the media, and even the churches. Why do we have all these discussions in our churches about sexuality and all kinds of other things? Because the church is not immune to the cultural revolutions. And when that percolates into our churches and into our thinking, eventually it can co-opt some churches as it has to where they become nothing but agents of the beast. When everything is defined to make us feel good and to believe that we can be who we ought to be, and that includes, as this, this expressive individualism means, being any gender, any what you fill in the blank, whatever you want to be, and your good libertarian appeal, you have a right to do that, this is a way of saying our culture is, is shifting. You might say, what does that have to do with this passage? Well, it shows that when the government itself becomes co-opted by this kind of thinking, and all the signs point in that direction, we will see them colluding with all the other institutions to squelch opposition. In other words, it's the culture that's driving the politics and not the other way around. You can see that in all the various isms, not only Marxism, but the sexual revolution, the heightened notions of racial and gender identity found in things like critical race theory, the politics of gender identity. For people committed to these points of view, this is not just a kind of thinking they have. For them, it's a moral issue. And you, we, if we oppose this, are considered simply evil and immoral. There's no dialogue. We are here to be coerced into towing the line, not to discuss. We are to bow the knee as repentant sinners in their, in their point of view, not someone to discuss, because they are on the right side of history. And we are expected to bow down. It's interesting. Just about six years ago in Indonesia, there was a big conference called the Yoga Karta conference and the principles are called the Yogyakarta principle and the argument of this and this has been adopted by many western countries and there's real pressure for the U.S. to adopt this is to say that there are no notions of gender but there's nothing but gender, gender fluidity. In other words you define your own gender as to whoever you are and it's simply evil and wrong to deny anybody that ability to do that. You might say well do you think American people will buy that? Well it's in education all over the place. It's in big business, the so-called woke capitalism. They constantly are having seminars for people who work in big business to convince you that all of these things are true. This is not the hard totalitarianism, such as you found in Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia. Much of this is what we call soft totalitarianism, in which people will obey anything if they get to keep their trinkets. You might, what do you mean, you might say? There are a lot of people that say, as long as I get my big screen TV, as long as every Saturday and every Sunday I can watch from 11 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night all the football that I want to, as long as I can have my barbecue, as long as I can do all this, who, who cares? And they will work with social media, they will work at other institutions to just feed you enough information so you feel like everything is okay. As long as I got my TV, my smartphone, my sporting events, my barbecue, what else do I need? The beast becomes in control and eventually the beast persecutes the Christians. That's what the text says. Christians get persecuted. What this passage, above all, reminds us is there are two, type of, two types of people in this world. Those who worship the beast and those who are God's children. They're not multiple types of people. Yeah, we have different ethnic backgrounds. We have different political persuasions, perhaps. We go, have different skin colors. 
But ultimately, the scripture says there are two types of people in this world, <laughs> those who worship the beast and those who are God's children. As I said, this has political implications, but when a significant portion of the culture has bought into this viewpoint, it's far more than just politics. And matter of fact, the politics will follow where the culture is going. And the culture buys into this idea of progress and everything is on, upward and onward and these beliefs are, are gonna carry the day and you just have to toe the line and you don't toe the line, you're an evil person because that's what they're saying. Then we, then we find what is happening in, in this passage. Now some say, well, well, should we organize militia cells and prepare for armed resistance? Maybe a day might come when, when some of that be necessary, but frankly, if our experience from totalitarian countries is any experience that we can learn from, that probably is not going to be the best way to resist this. But what we are, the best way is what the late Alexander Solzhenitsyn said this, and it was recently picked up by Christian cultural critic Rod Dreher, who wrote a book upon this, very fine book, by the way. He said, live not by lies. I like that title. Live not by lies lies because those who were in those hard totalitarian countries Christians most of them said was yeah the beast is trying to tell me lies but I don't live by lies I live by God's truth I don't live by lies and they said we won't live by that I had a good example that I knew a man a number of years ago came to the University of Iowa when I was a, a, a graduate student there. He had fled from Czechoslovakia. He was still called Czechoslovakia. He hadn't split into the Czech and Slovak republics yet. And he was able to get out. But he had gone to university there. Jan was his name. Uh, he anglicized it to John. But he told me that he was studying economics. And one day, his economics professor called him into his office. He looked around to make sure the room wasn't bugged. And he looked at him and he said, uh, Jan, he said, uh, I want you to know, he said, uh, I'm teaching you in the, in, the, in the university classroom here in Prague a number of these things, but he said, I want you to know that what every word that I'm teaching you is baloney, only he used a little bit more uh, graphic description word for that, uh, what he was teaching. But he says, to keep my job, I gotta teach this. He knew absolutely what he was doing was full of lies. Everything he was teaching was lies, but to keep his job, he was doing it. That was a wake-up call to my friend Yun, John. He said, I don't want to be in being taught something that is pure lies. Now, he had an opportunity. And he, uh, it's a long story how he, could, he was able to come to the U.S. But this was replicated by a number of other people in those countries. And they, they knew that the atheistic uh, teachings, the, the, the economic teaching, everything was just lies. And they kept truth alive. Resistors kept the truth alive, and they would meet in small groups, and they would say, we are here to keep truth alive. Now, that meant the truth of Christian doctrine, Christian ethics, of course, but it also meant the truth about history, the truth of the failure of, of the, many of the purported results of human thinking, of modern thinking. It meant reading good books that gave a different perspective, and they passed these out. Sometimes they printed them illegally and passed them around because they kept truth alive. It means teaching our children because it's so easy to fall into the falsehoods of these things. And I'm a big proponent of Christian education, but if, if you do elect a kid to, to leave your kids in the public schools, you probably made twice as much work for yourself if you're really going to uh, resist this. Because it means, I'll frank, be frank with you, you need to read every word that your kids read in their textbooks. <laughs> because it's in their textbooks, this kind of thinking. And if your kids are in public school, you just added a bunch of work for yourself. Because you need to read what their textbooks are saying. And you need to understand that. You might say, no, nah, this isn't going to happen out here. Yes, it can. Because the textbooks are printed by the same people. And the teachers are trained in the same schools of education that the big city people come from. It's a lot of work, but that's what we are called to do. 
It means we fight this consumerism that says that, that what you can buy is the be all and end all of life, or that sexual fulfillment is the highest good which drives so many today. Sexual fulfillment is defined by the particular person. Our Lord made, made this world and we have to consume goods, but we don't make idols of them. Sexual pleasure in marriage is a wonderful thing. It's God's gift, but to distort it as, as uh, modern sexual, sexual identities and pornography and all the other things do is to make an idol of it. And that is part of the work of the beast. Christian cultural critic Trevin Wax says that we must uh, make sex, take sexuality both more and less seriously than our culture does. We take it more seriously because it's God's gift for within marriage, and it's a wonderful thing that way, and it, and it reflects Christ and the church, but we take it less seriously because we say it is not the be-all and end-all of everything. Resistors under the hard totalitarianism said, we keep history alive. If you've ever read George Orwell's 1984, they had the Ministry of Truth, which had probably been called the Ministry of Falsehood because they kept rewriting the history textbooks. We need to keep truth alive. You, I'm, I love history. I love history. But some of you say, oh, history was boring. I don't like that. Well, if you don't know it, it'll get lost. And you will find that people will have no understanding of the, of the role of the church, the true role of the church. Now, that doesn't just mean watching the, the right news outlets or reading the only, quote, right conservative books. But it does mean that we have to be far better read. I'm giving you a big assignment. It's the truth. I'm telling you, you got a lot of work to do. Each one of us has a lot of work to do. And we need to all do that. That isn't just something your pastor or the elders need to do. Every single one of us have a lot of work to do if we are going to fight this possibility. Because it could very well be here. We have to take this seriously. It means sometimes that we have to find what we call the co-belligerents, and that are people who aren't necessarily Christians, but they know some, they, something smells rotten in Denmark to them. There's a very interesting experience of some of these Christian resistors under hard totalitarianism. They said they would find people who would, would sometimes have the same assumptions as, as the people who were oppressing them, but they knew they didn't like the outcomes. And they would say, you know, they would talk to the Christians and they would say, you know, something isn't right. Uh, I thought that this was all going to be wonderful, but it's not. Look at all this oppression. And what, the, what Christians found is that sometimes they could work on some things with some of these people, but it also opened up tremendous evangelistic opportunities because those people would understand sometimes that, that they had hung their, their beliefs on a skyhook. They, they didn't want the oppression but they were operating from the same principles as those who were doing the oppressing. And Christians had the opportunity to say, here's why these people are oppressing. Look at the, look at the, the beliefs that these people have. That's what leads them to be oppressors. But you have the same beliefs. Did it ever strike you how inconsistent your outcome is, what you want with the beliefs that you have? Above all, Again, as uh, Christian cultural critic Trevin Wax says, we have to know what time it is. You might say, wait a minute, it's after 1030. I know what time it is. He's been preaching for a long time here. But no, by that he means we need to know where we are in God's timetable. That doesn't mean we watch TV preachers who speculate about biblical prophecy. But it means in the timeline of the Bible of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration or consummation, we're between the last two. Christ has, has won the victory. He has defeated Satan in the primary battle. We're living between redemption and consummation. The book of Revelation has as its lodestar the final three chapters, which Jesus returns, defeats the beast, and makes all things new. There's a story, it's a great story, it's, I like to tell it. It's probably apocryphal, but I can't help it anyway, it's a great story. It's about, and, and I, I told it here before, bear with me please. But it's a story about in seminary, the two students were coming out of the classroom and they'd been studying the book of Revelation. And were, their heads were swimming with all the options and all of the various thinking. And they saw Sam the janitor minimally educated, who was ready, going to sweep up the floors. And he was reading his little pocket New Testament. And they said to Sam, you understand that book? 
because they, they saw he was reading the book of Revelation. He said, sure do. They're kind of taken back. And they said, well, Sam, what's it all about? Sam looked at these two seminary students and he said, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. That is our lodestar. When the, when the beast starts putting the squeeze on us, and the beast may very well do that. What's our lodestar? Jesus wins. Psalm 2. Hope you know that psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. It says, the kings of this earth gather against the Lord and his anointed, and they say, let's, let's destroy the Lord and his anointed. And what does Psalm 2 say? The Lord sits in the heaven, and what does he do? He laughs. The Lord laughs, and he says, you will not destroy my people. We are marked. The next chapter goes on to talk about the fact that we are marked. We are marked with a seal. The evil people are marked with the beast. They collaborate with the beast, the unbelievers. We are sealed. We are God's. He knows us. He's bought us with a price. He's redeemed us. We belong to him. It's that that gives us the backbone to be countercultural, even when it may hurt. Don't, don't worry, it, uh, it hurt a lot of people. Whether they're under communist or Nazi tyranny, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung five days before the end of World War II for collaborating against Hitler. They caught him, put him in prison, and then they hung him because he was involved in a plot to oust his, actually to, to, to uh, kill Hitler. They, that's the only way they thought they could get rid of him. That was a pretty, inter, pretty bold step for someone who was a, a Christian minister. But he was executed for that. Many others were put in concentration camps. It was a tough time. But what gave them the backbone? They knew the end of the story. They knew Jesus wins. In spite of all the Nazis talking about a thousand-year Reich, you know, a thousand-year reign, it lasted 12 years. <laughs> Think about that. Hitler said it was going to be a thousand-year reign, and it lasted 12 years. That's God sitting in the heavens and laughing and saying, Mr. Hitler, you and your Nazi cohorts may say you're going to persecute the church, the true church. I'll show you who really is in charge here. But that doesn't mean that there won't be some tough times. Just recently, the Supreme Court declined to hear a particular court case. A woman named Baronelle Stutzman, she owned a flower shop. And some folks who wanted a same-sex marriage, and this lady, Baronelle Stutzman, was a Christian. They came in, and they did this purposely. They knew where she stood. They did this purposely to make a point. They came in, and they said, we want you to do flowers. And she said, well, no, I'm a Christian. I can't do flowers for your same-sex marriage. They took her to court. They made it all the way through some appellate courts. The Supreme Court didn't, wouldn't take the case. They let the appellate courts stand. The appellate courts ruled in favor of the two gay guys. She stands, she's 76 years old. She stands to lose every dime she owns because she said, I'm a Christian. I can't do that. It was very explicitly because she was a Christian. Some of you may not have heard about that. And if you haven't, it's simply because you're not doing your job to know what's going on in this world. As I said, I'm giving you work to do. We need to be aware so that we can resist. It doesn't mean we can't be patriotic and work for good government and resist in legitimate ways our system allows, but it means we will take seriously what this text says is that the government itself can and may be turned against us, and it will collaborate with religious and economic institutions to do just that. I'm reminded of, in the 18th century, French Huguenot lady. In France, the French Huguenot were the French Reform, French Protestants. They had certain freedoms, and Louis XIV decided to get rid of them because he thought there were, oh, there's just a few thousand of those and they aren't going to, they're not going to be any problem. That's what his advisors told him anyway, so he revoked their freedoms. Some of them conformed to what his wishes were, but there were some that didn't. There was a lady named Marie Durand who was put in a prison, and they told her all she had to do was renounce her reformed faith. 
She said, I can't do that. It's true. It's what the scriptures teach. I cannot renounce that. Well, Marie, you stay in prison then. 36 years Marie Duran stayed in that prison. And you know what they found scratched on the walls of that prison? In French, and you don't need to know a lot of French to get the meaning of this word, this shit, written on there was resiste. Resiste. That's what she was doing. Resisting. She could have, got, could have gotten her freedom if she had denied the biblical truth. She said, the truth is more important than my freedom. The truth is more important than my freedom. Well, we are God's people. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We're sealed by God. The next chapter will tell us that. We are called to understand the evil one will wage war against us and even use legitimate God-ordained institutions. What more God-ordained institutions than religious institutions and the, and the government can you find? But that's where we're being used by the evil one. But what do we do? We live out by the truth. That Christ has won the decisive blow. He sits in the heaven and he laughs at those who think they can squelch his people. That he will wrap up human history. One day he will return. And every knee will bow. The beast of all types will be destroyed. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We stand. We're called to stand firm in that light. To do that correctly, we have to have truth. There's a lot of work for us. Yeah, <laughs> the, the lazy, when I put it bluntly, the lazy pagans could watch their football games all day <laughs> on their big screen TVs, play with their cell phones and barbecue uh, as much as they want. We're called to do a lot more work. You know, say, oh, I don't know if I like that. Well, that's what we're called to do. We're called to be God's people and resist. Know the truth. Know his word. Know the truth about history. Know the truth about what's going on in this world. We are called to be people who don't live by lies, but live by the truth. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. May we be people who live by your truth. We thank you so much that you've given us this passage of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to stand and sing our final hymn today, number 393 in Great Hymns of the Faith, Take My Life and Let It Be. We'll be singing stanzas one, two, and four. Let's hear God's blessing. And now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will 
working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.